Morning, guys. <clears throat> Good to see everybody online. Good to see y'all in the room. Uh, hard to believe Easter's passed, huh? That, uh, that came and went quickly. Uh, interesting that it's already mid-April now. At least it feels like the end of April. Summer's upon us. Uh, so this week, we're going to press forward in time. Uh, beyond the resurrection, beyond the resurrection stories, and uh, or beyond the resurrection of Jesus story, and into some of the uh, appearances of Jesus. And uh, we're going to start that journey in John's gospel. We've spent a lot of time in Mark's gospel of late. Uh, this week, we're going to be over in John's gospel, in part because Mark uh, comes to an abrupt end, as, uh, as Phil uh, alluded to on Sunday. But John's gospel continues on uh, really at length beyond Easter Sunday morning. So we're going to spend some time there. Uh, I these slides, there's no, uh, um, uh, there's no presentation, but if you have your Bible, you, you may want to follow along. We're going to be in John chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 19, and uh, I'm going to break it up into three sections. And so I'll do a little teaching, and then we'll have a little discussion. I'll do a little teaching. We'll have some discussion. And then we'll break into our, our groups. One of the things that, that y'all probably have, uh, for those of you who have uh, been to studies that I've done before, you know by now, I think that I really like tying New Testament and Old Testament. Um, and I, I love the notion that um, the work of Jesus wasn't the beginning of God's work. It was the fulfillment of God's work. And so I like showing and exploring uh, kind of Old Testament, New Testament connections. Those are less present uh, in this text. They're present for sure, but it's interesting what John does as his gospel comes to an end. And there's some who say that, that the end of chapter 20 is the, the actual end of John's gospel. But as he draws, whether it's the end of chapter 20 or the end of chapter 21, as John draws his gospel to a close, he starts tying up loose ends. And it's really interesting what happens here in the next five verses, starting in verse 19 of chapter 20. Uh, you really get this deluge of images, I think, of, um, uh, of, of things that were foreshadowed early, by Jesus earlier in his ministry and now uh, fulfilled, drawn to a close, that kind of thing. So we'll jump around in John's gospel. You'll want to be in, in John chapter 20. Uh, if you want to go explore some of this stuff later, then maybe you can write down some of the, uh, some of the passages that I'll reference. But it, it just is really interesting to me. And I don't know that I'd seen it much before my prep for this. I don't know that I'd seen how much John is trying to wrap things up and demonstrate that uh, what Jesus said would happen has actually happened. And that's an important message for a post-Easter uh, time of reflection for us, uh, that, uh, that what God said would happen has happened, which means uh, that what God is saying is going to happen is going to happen in the end for us. So with all that said, we'll start in verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week. So this is Easter night, right? The same day that Jesus is resurrected on the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them. And there's already a couple of things that we want to point out. The first is the timing. It's interesting that John repeats the timing. It's the... Uh, he says it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week. He puts some emphasis on the fact that this is the first day of the week, which is interesting because in John chapter 20, right, when on Easter Sunday morning, let's see, how does that start? Early on the first day of the week, John is concerned that we are clear that this happens on the first day of the week. And the question that comes to mind is why? Why does John care that this happened on the first day of the week? Uh, and, and I think the answer is, is fairly clear that this is, this is a new creation event. I think what John is recalling to mind, what John is emphasizing, is that in the resurrection of Christ, we have a new beginning. And so we're hearkening all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, and, and not only that, but, but John, throughout his gospel, has been dropping little Easter eggs, as Phil said, that this is a new creation that we have in Christ. Think about the very beginning of John's gospel. Anybody remember the first words of John chapter one? I heard somebody say, maybe it was Michael, in the beginning. What does that sound like? 
sounds awfully familiar. Sounds a lot like Genesis chapter one in the beginning. So you have uh, multiple points of contact with the first day of the week, first day of the week, with multiple points of contact with God's creational activity. And so I think we need to keep this in mind, not just as we reflect on Easter in general, but as we look at this passage, as we look at this story, that John is drawing clear ties that God is doing a new thing, that God is still creating, that God is creating something new. So early, uh, or when it was evening on the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. And you can imagine uh, at this point in time, while some of the uh, while, while the women have had an experience with the risen Christ, there's still a high degree of fear and anxiety among the disciples. And so what do they do? They retreat and they hide away. They are dominated by fear. And uh, this is something that, uh, that we, know, we know a little bit about uh, in this world. And uh, fear is one of those things that um, is perpetrated upon us, I think, uh, a lot right now. But you and I have both had experiences with fear that has paralyzed us and fear that has caused us to retreat, so to speak. And I think that's exactly what's happening with the disciples. They've retreated into a locked room. Was it the same room as the Last Supper took place? I don't know, maybe, possibly. Uh, a lot of ink spilled about whether that's true. I'm not sure how important it is. But the, the important, the salient point is the disciples have retreated. They have pulled back. Their world has been torn apart. They do not know what to do. They do not know what to say. They do not know what to believe. And so they're in, I think, a state of paralysis. And that, I think, is important. And it feels, again, this may be a stretch, but it feels a lot like the beginning of Genesis again. The earth was a dark and formless void, right? Uh, in the beginning, there was just nothing. There was darkness, and I think that's where the disciples have gone back to. So we've created this image. I think John is creating this image for us of a new beginning, right? We've heard the first part of that in John, at the, in the beginning of John chapter 20. Uh, we're continuing that theme as we move deeper into that chapter. So uh, the disciples are met. They locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you couple interesting things. Jesus is teleporting now. We'll deal with that in a minute. Um, Jesus's first words to the disciples as a group, peace be with you. We should expect this, I think. I think we should expect these to be Jesus's words. A lot of times when God shows up on the scene, we hear, don't be afraid. This is a similar sentiment, right? Do not be afraid. Uh, the, the word from Jesus is peace be with you. And this really, I think, is a, a callback. Again, remember that John is pointing out those elements of Jesus's ministry that are coming full circle and tying up all those loose ends. So if you go back to John chapter, uh, chapter 14, listen to this. I'm going to read a few verses and uh, one of them has to do with peace. One of them has to do with the spirit. One of them has to do with uh, rejoicing. All of those are going to be important. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 25. I've said these things to you while I am still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not let your hearts, uh, let's see, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that, I am go that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. And so these are Jesus's words not long before his death. Jesus says, my peace I, I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Right? Peace is one of the definitive marks of the kingdom of God. Right? This is one of the central elements. Right? In a world that is at war with each other, in a world that is um, characterized by spiritual war, we see this in John's gospel and throughout the gospels, in a, in a world that has been defined by war since sin entered into it. The gift of the gospel, the gift of the ministry of Jesus is peace. 
This is not a, a greeting. I sign my emails, peace in Christ, uh, which sounds trite at times. This is not a trite greeting from Jesus. This is a giving of a gift. Um, and, and one of the most important gifts that we can experience in the gospel, my peace, I give with you. So Jesus says, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Very interesting, right? There's something about the resurrection body. Keep in mind, and I, I know that those of you who have been in church for a long time already know this, but just by way of reminder or introduction for a couple of you, keep in mind that the resurrection of Jesus was not a spiritual resurrection. This is not a resurrection that the ghost of Jesus has come back. And that's a really hard point to keep in mind in this particular story, because not once but twice, Jesus is about to teleport through a door. And it causes all kinds of questions, right? The disciples are in a locker room. Somehow Jesus shows up in the midst of them. In a minute, we're going to see the same story play out once again. And so we're tempted to come to this story with an unintentional image of a ghostly Jesus. And that is not what's happening. Right, the, the scars on the hands and the, and the side are a reminder that this was a bodily resurrection, that the body of Jesus, the physical body of Jesus has risen from the dead as a foretaste of our resurrection. Our resurrection, friends, is not a spiritual resurrection. It is a bodily resurrection, right? The, the end of our story is not teleportation to another world that is called heaven. The end of our story is the resurrection of our bodies into the redeemed, healed, and restored physical earth. That's the end of our story. We get a foretaste of that in this, um, uh, another Easter egg, like Phil says. Uh, we get a foretaste of that in, uh, in, in this part of the story, right? Jesus shows up, and he shows them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced right we heard that pass we heard that um, we heard jesus say you will rejoice you're mourning now but you will rejoice you're going to read more about that you can go to john 16 verse 22 or verse 20 through 22 but the disciples rejoiced when they saw the lord and jesus said to them again peace be with you as the father has sent me so i send you i think another interesting piece here and so as the father has sent me we have a clear sense of that even in John's gospel, we have a clear sense from Jesus that he's been sent by the Father. These are probably familiar words to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Read the next verse, though. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. There's a clear sense from Jesus. And John records this so that we would have the same clear sense that the Father has sent the son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Angry Jesus is not a reality. Right? Our culture likes to talk about angry Jesus. Some of our brothers and sisters like to present an image of angry Jesus, but angry Jesus isn't a reality. The Jesus that came into the world didn't come to be mad. The Jesus that came into the world came to save the world. So here Jesus says, once again, peace be with you. He's giving that gift again. He says, as the Father sent me, Let's see. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And that's where things get a little uncomfortable for me. I'm comfortable with God sending Jesus. I'm less comfortable with God sending me. And I kind of wonder what the disciples are thinking at this point as well. Are the disciples have this experience with the risen Christ. He, he stands before them. They're in, in their fear, in their anxiety, in their darkness. He comes into their midst and says, Peace be with you. And you have this immediate reaction of joy they were overjoyed but now but now jesus says as god sent me i'm sending you and the question is to do what jesus what is it that you're sending us to do i think that's what the disciples the disciples i think at this point are kind of whiplashed right well what do you mean you're sending us i, I thought you were the thing i thought i thought you were the thing that was going to happen jesus so you just keep doing your thing, Jesus, and we'll cheer you on. Way to go, buddy. But Jesus is clear. Just like I've been sent, you have been sent. I think one of the crucial questions for us is to do what? I think this is a, a question that works on multiple levels. I think this works for you as an individual. You cannot escape this question. To do what? 
Jesus has sent you. The question is to do what? I think this works on a community level, like for our church. Just as the Father sent Jesus into Dunwoody, Jesus is sending Dunwoody UMC into Dunwoody. To do what? And I think this is a question that works cosmically, if I can say it that way. That the, the whole body of Christ is being sent, and this moment is being sent into the world. Right? This works so, so well with Matthew's gospel. At the end, the, something called the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, is some of the last words that Jesus speaks, um, uh, are to send his disciples into the world to make disciples of all nations. So we've got a, a crucial question that's got to be answered individually. It's got to be answered communally, and it's got to be answered, I think, even cosmically may not be the right word, but you get the sense. Listen to how he continues. He gives us, I think, a hint. When he had said this, he breathed onto them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We have another call back to Genesis, right? Uh, when uh, in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, as God is creating Adam, he breathes into, he breathes life into Adam. In Genesis one, chapter one, it says that a wind from God swept across the face of the deep. That word wind and the word breathed, and the word spirit are all the same word in both Hebrew and in Greek. Uh, it's all the same word. Well, it's the same word in Hebrew. It's a different word in Greek, but, this, but it's one word to represent uh, breath, wind, and spirit. And so again, we can't escape the new creation. And it starts to, to, to raise some similar questions. What is this new creation? What is being created anew in us in light of Easter? What is it that's happening? What is God? What new thing is God wanting to do? And so we hear a callback to that again. Receive the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, we often think of Acts chapter 2 as, as Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the world. We get a foretaste of that here. The disciples in this upper room are receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit. You talk about another definitive element of the kingdom of God. It is the presence of God that resides in us. And I think nobody says it better than Paul. This is uh, Romans chapter eight, I think verse 11. What Paul will say is that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit that lives in you. So you have, we have resurrection power living in us. And we see the first gift of that spirit right here uh, on Easter evening. And remember, this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. Right? I'm going to send you the, the advocate, an advocate, the spirit, to remind you of all the things that I've taught you. But that was John 14 that we just looked at. So receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I like the first part of that. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. I wonder if that's one way that we could answer the question, what are we sent to do? We are sent to forgive. It's right there, right? As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you to do what? Receive the Holy Spirit and forgive the people around you. That's interesting. Uh, we might want to reconsider our frequent criticism of our Catholic brothers and sisters for their practice of confession. Right? We get this wrong on a pretty regular basis. And in fact, it's not really our fault. Even the Catholics misunderstand their own doctrine more often than not. Um, but, but listen to this. Right? A lot of times we criticize the Catholics because they go to a priest to confess. And they have to do some kind of penance and share, uh, uh, pray, you know, whatever prayers. And then hear words of forgiveness. Well, Okay. That sounds pretty familiar. In fact, that sounds a lot like what Jesus is saying to do. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. The Catholic practice of confession, I think, can be, let me, let me be clear, it can be a beautiful example of exactly what Jesus is telling his disciples to do and exactly what Jesus is empowering his disciples to do, right? part of the criticism is only God can forgive my sins. I don't need a priest to forgive my sins. Only God can for forgive my sins. Well, yes, that's true. But God's using us to forgive the sin. Jesus says it right there. Jesus empowers it right there. 
I think this is one of the most interesting and misunderstood and powerful aspects of gospel ministry is that you possess the power to speak a word of forgiveness into somebody's life who thinks they aren't worthy of it. And I got to tell you, friends, if you've never been, if you've never experienced this, get thee to somebody you trust. Because when you are broken in your own sin, and when you think, and let me say it differently, when you know that there's no chance that God can love you because of what you've done, well, you go to a brother and you say, this is what I've done. I need some help. And that brother says to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Those words are water to a parched soul. Those words have the power to change. And that's not arrogance. Right? That's not, you're not presuming to take God's place in this. You are, in fact, doing what Jesus has commanded. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. If you have forgiven the sins of any, they are forgiven them. We skip over that. Why do we skip over that? I think because it makes us uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable to consider that I have the power because the spirit of God lives in me. I have the power to forgive sins. That makes me uncomfortable. But gosh, you can change somebody's life with those words. The second half of that, I'm less comfortable with. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And my question for you is, when is it right? When is it righteous to withhold forgiveness? If, it, if the answer were never, Jesus wouldn't have said it. So I'm going to leave that for your discussion groups. Good luck. Uh, so I want to stop there briefly, ask for some questions of clarification. We're going to move to uh, a story about Thomas and Jesus in a second. Any questions of clarification? Those verses are thick to me, and that's part of why I wanted to split it up today. It's because there's a lot in those five verses that we can play around with, but I want to make sure that we're clear. You'll have some time for discussion in a minute, but let me pause. Questions? Wasn't there a point in the gospel where Jesus really ticked off uh, the Jewish leadership by, by forgiving sins? Like, wasn't that, wasn't that a a big trigger for them, just like how, like, who would you to be able to step in and do this? I mean, does this, does this carry through that like, pretty radical act in that day, saying that you human have the power to forgive someone's sins because I mean, people didn't like Christ said that. Is this, am I misremembering that? Is that is it Did you guys online hear that question? So yeah. the question, Brian's question is a really good one. Um, didn't Jesus kind of get in trouble or, or come into conflict with some of the Jewish leadership earlier in his ministry when he forgives sins? Isn't that an audacious thing for Jesus to have done? Isn't that an even more audacious thing for Jesus to empower his disciples to do? The answer is yes and yes. So somebody will remember the, the passage or the story, but uh, Jesus heals somebody and forgives them. Uh, the folks, no, no, no. Is this the... Uh, uh, the healing of the paralytic, is this what happens? Yes. Healing of the paralytic, thanks. Uh, so Jesus heals this guy, and there's an exchange. Anybody have that reference? What's what, Luke? It's in Luke's gospel. It's worth going to read. Jesus has an exchange. Is it easier for me to, to heal this man and help him to walk or to forgive his sin? Uh, and, uh, and so that's part of the tension. That's a great callback to something that happens earlier in Jesus' ministry. It's audacious. Like we've said, uh, for us, it was just as audacious, maybe even more audacious for them to have heard this word from Jesus. Um, so, yeah, great point. There's always the question about who's the heart for Jesus. So, to me, leads into that question. David says there's always the question about whose authority, by whose authority are you doing this? Uh, and this is part of the question from the Jewish leadership uh, to Jesus as he's forgiving sin and healing people. I think that's a Sabbath reference to. Um, okay, any other questions of clarification before we move on to Thomas? Guys online, let me give you a chance. Good to go. Okay. All right, so uh, let me read through these next six verses real fast. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciple told him, We have, the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. 
But when he said to them, unless I see, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Lord Thomas. <laughs> it's disgusting. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with him. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Sounds familiar. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your finger and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Thomas is a guy who's shown up a couple times in John's gospel. Uh, I think John 11 and maybe 14, if you want to go back and read those stories. The first time Thomas is saying, I'll go to my death for you, Jesus. And the second time Thomas is saying, I have no idea what you're saying, Jesus, which is great. Uh, Jesus is talking about his coming death and resurrection and Thomas doesn't get it at all. Um, I think Thomas gets a bad rap, right? His name, Doubting Thomas. Um, I get it. To some degree, it's deserved. These, these men that he has lived with for the last, at least the last three years, come to him and say, yep, he rose from the dead. And Thomas is just supposed to believe that. Uh, you know, we know the story. And so it's easier for us to kind of throw stones at Thomas. But put yourself in his shoes. It's an unbelievable story in the first century life, right? In the first century world. Right? Nobody's just going to believe that, right? And so Thomas responds just like, frankly, I think most of us would respond. Maybe a little bit more graphically. Got a thing for sticking his fingers and nail holes. That's gross. I don't know. He wants physical proof. That's really what he wants. He wants physical proof. If you want to believe this, prove it is what Thomas says. And so we have a replay, right? It's one week later. It's again, the first day of the week. It says, though the same setting is recreated for Thomas's purpose, for Thomas's benefit. First day of the week, peace be with you. It's time to stop doubting, and it's time to believe. Here's the question that I have. What's Jesus's tone here? Again, I think we're, I think we're so bombarded culturally with expectations of an angry Jesus that, that I supply a tone and an attitude to Jesus that isn't present in the text, and I'm not sure that it was actually there. I supply angry, frustrated, impatient Jesus. Could you please get on with it, Thomas? That's the tone. This, by the way, is a good reason why you should never get too upset by text messages, because you can't actually read tone in a text. Can't read a tone in these words at times, so we supply it. But I wonder if that angry, frustrated, impatient tone is right. I wonder if that actually matches both the story and everything else that we know about Jesus. I wonder if instead we have a patient, encouraging tone. I wonder if instead Jesus is coming to Thomas. Jesus didn't make Thomas search him out. Thomas is doubting. Thomas is struggling in faith. So who comes to who? Jesus comes to Thomas. And then walks with him from doubt to faith. Walks with him from unbelief to belief. That doesn't sound angry to me. It doesn't sound impatient to me. It sounds like Jesus showing up exactly in the way that Thomas needed him to show up. I think that's such an important word for us to hear. It's, it, <clears throat> excuse me. It's an important word for us to hear in our own lives. I think for those of you with kids. Uh, whether young or grown, uh, who have uh, maybe struggled with Thomas's struggle. It's an important word for us to hear, that Jesus is still coming to us, walking with us in our own unbelief. And then Thomas's response, my Lord and my God, this is not an exclamation, my God. That's not what Thomas is saying. It's a profession. It's a profession of faith. At long last, at the end of John's gospel, when so much of John's gospel has been focused on the divinity of Jesus, 
all the I am statements. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and life, all aimed at revealing Jesus's divine identity. And finally, it's Thomas at the end of John's gospel is the first one who directly addresses Jesus as God. This is the ultimate revelation um, in John's gospel of Jesus's own identity. And then the, the, that last verse 29, I think is a word to us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. I think this is speaking directly to us. I'll close with this. Now, Jesus, this is verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. You want to know why John's writing the gospel? That, that verse right there. John captured these stories, right? Of all the stories that John could have captured of Jesus's life, John captures these stories with an express purpose that you would believe. And through believing that you would have life. So let me catch some questions of clarification real quick before we move to discussion. We've got about 20 minutes for discussion. Any questions of clarification on these last two passages? Yeah. Yeah, good question. For those of you, just so y'all can hear, uh, the question is, um, when Jesus comes back, he, he appears to a relatively small number of people. Why not show up to um, Mercedes-Benz Stadium and reveal himself to thousands of thousands of people in, uh, in his resurrected self? Uh, I think it's a fair question. You know, I think the, the total number is about 500, uh, and, uh, 500 people that the resurrected Jesus appears to. And I think part of this is because Jesus is sending us, um, right? And this is, this is where it begins, in fact, right? That Jesus is sending his disciples into the world um, to tell that story and to show what resurrected living looks like. But that's a question that I'll probably take to heaven with me. Wouldn't it have been easier, God? It's a fair question. I don't know ultimately the answer. I wish I did. Yeah, yeah, it's a fair question. Any other questions of clarification? All right, so we've got discussion questions for you. There are five. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Not all questions are equal. Uh, some of these questions will have absolutely no interest to you. I'm comfortable with that. You don't have to do these questions in order. In fact, you don't have to do all these questions. So... Here's my encouragement to you. Read uh, as you break into your groups. Have somebody read all five questions and then y'all pick where to start. Pick the one that's interesting that you think will, will provide the best conversation for your group uh, and, and, and go at that question and then, you know, knock them off in whatever order you want to. So that's all I've got. And I think we've got questions on the screen. Uh, they are. I'll put them up there on the screen. They're in the chat for people online. I'll put them up on the screen. Uh, we'll be back here at about... Uh, 13 minutes. Uh, we'll see you back here in a few. Great.